Oceani God, Jackie Ohat Lee Dawa Don't Ah. Hello, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to our 48th annual symposium on the American Indian. Um, as you know, we have many sessions throughout uh, the week, and we encourage you to check out the agenda and you know see what all is going on. We'll also be recording all sessions, which will be made available in the coming weeks. Um, and now it is my honor and privilege privilege to introduce our uh, presenter for today. Um, today's presentation is called Connection to Land, Language, and Culture, the Key to Preventing Indigenous Health Disparities with Dr. Melissa Lewis, who is Shergi and at the University of Missouri. Dr. Melissa Lewis is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri School of Medicine in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Dr. Lewis received her PhD in medical family therapy. She is an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation and her research interests span integrated healthcare models with indigenous patients, preparing healthcare professionals to work with indigenous populations effectively and examining the role of stress and trauma on cardiovascular disease in indigenous populations and interventions aimed to empower indigenous families and communities by privileging indigenous knowledge and practices. And it is without further ado, I would like to um, let Ms. or Dr. Lewis start. Thank you. Hello, Jackie. Um, Siona God. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here today with you all and uh, excited to have this conversation with you. Um, it's been a really great symposium. I really enjoyed it. There's great stuff on the schedule today and tomorrow, too. So I'm just happy to be here with all of you this morning. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about um, indigenous health disparities today and a little bit about, um, you know, the cultural components to addressing health disparities. And we have a special guest, uh, which is Mr. Tom Belt. Uh, Tom Belt uh, is a retired uh, professor at Western Carolina University. Uh, a he's a retired, uh, uh, retired from there teaching the Cherokee language. So. Um, he and I have been working together on some projects and he uh, graciously agreed to be recorded for um, some video in this, in this presentation. All right, so y'all let me know if you can't see or hear anything when we get to it. So if I had to sum up the, the presentation today, it would have these four points. One is that indigenous health and well-being is holistic means it consists of both physical, emotional, social, and cultural health and the relationship that those components have with one another. Colonization has degraded the health status and well-being of Indigenous people. However, Indigenous culture and the act of cultural revitalization and decolonization relate to positive health status of Native people. And finally, traditional cultural practices like foodways, language use, and cultural activities are preventative measures to both physical health and mental health risks. So a colleague uh, of mine, Laurel Myra and I did um, a brief literature review of indigenous health disparities with this, this literature review was particularly focused on um, healthcare settings, but I just wanted to share um, what we discovered, which was um, quite upsetting. So at many levels, Indigenous people experience disparities that relate um, to poor health. So we found that Native people suffer from illnesses at higher rates. They receive less treatment um, for these illnesses compared to um, non-Native people. They receive worse treatment, more medical errors, for example, increased disease mortality, meaning not only do Native people um, contract these illnesses at higher rates, but they're more likely to die from them compared to their non-Native counterparts. Um, they're more likely to experience racism in their health contexts. Um, this is an area of research I won't talk about today, but um, <clears throat> we're doing some work in and finding just how chronic and how prevalent racism is towards Native people in health contexts. Also Native people are more likely to receive treatment that devalues their belief system. So not, it, it might go hand in hand with racism, but um, a director of an Indian health service clinic once told me they were, they were non-Native, 
that one of their patients came in and told them that they received, before they came there, they received trist, a, a treatment from their traditional healer, especially around pain. And this particular physician and was a director told me that they laughed at them. And um, many years later, he told me this because he realized that he was wrong. But this is an example of devaluing indigenous health belief systems. Um, and, and finally, native people are underrepresented in medicine and healthcare, you know, across the healthcare spectrum from um, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, um, and administrators, which means that indigenous health beliefs are absent or, you know, there's a, they're largely missing from healthcare systems. And uh, again, that's a whole another discussion, but native people experience disproportionate barriers to success in the medical field that, you know, that means, you know, um, educational barriers starting in pre-K, for example. So with all that being said, um, the pathways for health disparities um, start with colonization, historical trauma, and interpersonal trauma. Um, hopefully these are uh, terms you're familiar with. I'm kind of assuming that everyone has uh, knowledge about these particular areas. I won't define them today, but if, if uh, you need assistance, feel free to email me or, or look, look them up. Um, you know, in particular, people who experience uh, colonial um, uh, um, oppression from colonization or historical trauma are more likely to be disconnected from their traditional cultural life ways. They're more likely to have trauma experience and the distress that comes with trauma experience. And um, indigenous people are more likely to experience racism and discrimination chronically, you know, throughout their, their lifespan. And that relates to increased, not just mental health distress and illness, but physical health distress and illness, as well as interpersonal and intergenerational um, distress. A more detailed look at what this model is, uh, is presented here. This is from a research article that was published this year. I personally have an interest in researching cardiometabolic disease based on um, the experience of I've, the experiences that I've had with my family members, um, heart disease and diabetes um, runs in my family. And I personally have experienced healthcare systems and their responses and beliefs about heart disease within an indigenous communities from um, the experiences my dad has had suffering from um, diabetes and from heart disease. And so, those experiences made me want to look into where these biases, these disparities are coming from. And when you know, our team took a look at the literature, we found that there's a lot more to heart disease, for example, indigenous people than just needing to do diet and exercise, a lot more. And so in particular, indigenous people suffer from, we talked about this already, a little bit historical loss and trauma um, high rates of early childhood stress and trauma and high rates of adulthood stress and trauma. And those kinds of experiences uh, lead to distress, both psychological distress and physiological <clears throat> uh, factors. In particular, what's interesting about cardiometabolic disease and depression, they have a bi-directional relationship, which means if I get diagnosed with heart disease tomorrow, I'm more likely to suffer from depression and vice versa. If I have mental health distress, I'm more likely to be diagnosed with cardiometabolic disease in the future. So that's a, sort of that middle component. That upper component is about the physiology. And there's been a lot more research in the area of, of physiological, uh, uh, physio <laughs> physiological factors and heart disease relationship in African-American communities. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll start to see this in indigenous communities too. Essentially, trauma relates to an autonomic nervous system response. So that's the fight or flight. And when that is in overdrive or occurs chronically, things happen um, physiologically, including inflammation. 
Inflammation is a key component in cancer, for example, and in heart disease. So that is one pathway, a couple of pathways I've described that relates to increased uh, diagnosis of cardiometabolic disease. And I, I apologize, um, cardiometabolic disease um, includes things like diet, type two diabetes, heart disease, increased blood pressure, increased blood glucose. Those are some examples as well as stroke. Um, they're all um, related to one another. And so again, this, these pathways relate to, relate to increased cardiometabolic risk, incidence and mortality. There is sort of a pathway on the bottom I wanted to talk about a little bit. And, and that's the pathway that really, to me is very interesting. And it is the cultural piece. So not only has colonization increased the amount of stress and trauma that indigenous people have experienced, it has suppressed or negated factors that we know are protective factors or resilience uh, factors um, that keep indigenous people healthy and um, you know, living, living positive and healthy lifestyles. So colonization has disrupted or eliminated traditional life ways, such as cultural life ways, spiritual and social life ways. In particular, if we're thinking about diet and exercise, um, which is just a small piece of the cardiometabolic uh, disease pathway um, that is re uh, related to reduction of hunting and fishing and foraging and farming. And, um, you know, as well as a reduction of traditional cultural practices and social networks and a reduction of traditional medicines. So kind of following that, that bottom pathway, um, if any of you know me, you know that I love learning about traditional foods and food systems um, and plants. So in my example, I'm gonna highlight them. So indigenous people have significantly different diets and exercise patterns compared to pre-colonization. Um, we could look at other things too, besides food. We could look at social and political networks, um, uh, traditional spirituality, um, you know, but this is just one example of the relationship with colonization and revitalization. So in this particular example, um, things have, you know, due to colonization, we see that indigenous people have had, have been forced to use European farming methods, um, introduced European animals and plants, animals such as um, cows, chickens, pigs. Um, there's a prohibition of traditional ecological knowledge, methods and techniques, including indigenous knowledge, indigenous sciences, forced relocation and environmental degradation, all of those um, have related to you know, negative effects on our food systems. So, for, so the prohibition of these traditional foods is linked to an increased sedentary lifestyle, which we know relates to cardiometabolic disease. And research has found that the changes in these food systems of indigenous people has led to increased obesity, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and mental health distress. And just some other examples of, of you know, how uh, detrimental colonization has been to food ways. Historically prohibited traditional foods may have protected indigenous people from metabolic disease. So for example, uh, in the Tahana Atom community, the tepary bean is amazing micronutrients and um, ways to prevent people from getting metabolic disease. And it's a beautiful story if you don't know it about this uh, tepary bean. Um, we know people in this region have suffered from diabetes at some of the highest rates in the nation. And um, someone rediscovered some of these beans, some of these seeds um, in, um, in an old dresser and started to regrow them. And these are just really amazing, amazing foods. Salmon for the Yupik or for the people of the Northwest. We know that environmental degradation like dams and damming have negatively affected um, the life cycle of salmon. And here um, in Cherokee Nation, 
Jerusalem artichokes, hickory nuts, and persimmons are extremely heart healthy. There's an amazing article about um, persimmons. And unfortunately, people don't eat these foods as often and they're, they're less available. Many of these places where hickory nuts and persimmons are, um, people have and actually unfortunately continue to make way for land um, and for cows and grazing, for example. So many tribes have also remedies and ceremonies to treat things like diabetes and heart disease like the use of hawthorn or sumac leaves, um, which we've, you know, which are known to lower blood pressure and glucose, but traditional medicine has been negatively affected by colonization as well due to the prohibition uh, to, of, practice, of practicing traditional spirituality, you know, until the Indian Freedom of Religion Act in 1978. But these practices still carry stigmas today due to carry over those policies. Like I talked about the physician that shared with me um, really putting down traditional medicine currently. Other studies have found that folks that have had to participate in forced colonial assimilation programs relate to worsened physical and mental health status. So one study found that compared to their same age peers, those who attended boarding schools forcibly had more health problems than, their, than peers their same age who did not have to attend boarding schools. That was an interesting study. And then there's a similar study that happened in the Pacific Northwest that found that the effects of historical trauma um, compared to those who did not have the effects of historical trauma related to increased health risks as well. So the antidote to colonization is decolonization. And, and many of you might be familiar with the amazing Dr. Linda Smith and she defines decolonization as this. It is a euphemism that only describes the formal handing over of the instruments of government, when in reality, it must be a long-term process involving the cultural, linguistic, and psychological divesting of colonial parameters. And Dr. Went and Gon said, to uncover the detrimental effects of European American colonialism and to assist historically colonized groups with preserving and reclaiming their distinctive cultural legacies, strengths, and institutions. So if we think about health disparities, we have to get to the root of the problem. And luckily, um, you know, people are now seeing colonization, uh, excuse me, uh, colonialism and racism as social determinants of health. You know, previously people would say the social determinants of health are things like um, the, the zip code that you grew up in, the availability that you and your family have to uh, healthy foods, um, poverty status. But in fact, the effect of colonization and um, your experience of racism are now deemed social determinants of health. And uh, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People says in Article 24 that Indigenous people have the right to their traditional medicines and to maintain their health practices. This includes the conservation of vital medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. And Indigenous indiv individuals have the right to access without discrimination all social and health services. So this is the goal. And before we would go on, I wanted to kind of bring Mr. Tom Belt in to talk a little bit about what decolonization looks like uh, using a Cherokee uh, perspective, a Cherokee worldview. And I just want to make sure real quick that the, yep, the sound is all optimized here. And, um, oh, my apologies, let me go back. What you'll note is that Cherokee decolonization and Cherokee language are um, intimately connected. Please holler if you have any sound issues. I'll go ahead and start. That's, you know, it's a clear, yeah, yeah. to me, that's a clear indicator of mental health and stuff is when you're a part of something. about here is that decolonizing it makes makes things it puts everything into perspective 
and it creates that Cherokee prism by which we by which we see the colors of the world and it's a different prism than what we've been given you know we see things differently that way that's the most philosophical way that i can put it you know yeah that, that that's a wonderful way to put it because when we, we've heard Cherokee speakers say, right, I've said it a hundred times. It seems like when we're talking, you know, we can be sitting in a room talking about stuff when we can be using English. But the second we start talking Cherokee, everything changes. It's not the same place. The topic may be the same. Everything, you know, we, we haven't changed. It's still the same room, still the same table, still the same window still the same world, but something about it has changed now and we've shifted into a whole different kind of a way of looking at the world. So that's that prism, you know, mm. and that's achieved through language, you know. It's not mm -hmm. described anymore. In other words, we stopped using the term depression, which means bad feelings, and we start seeing the word for what it really means, you know. It changes the way we look at stuff. And uh, that word then becomes not a uh, decision or a sentence, but it becomes a call to action. You know, if you start thinking about yourself and yourself only, then it means that we have to figure out a way to get you back into the world to where you start looking outward, you know. It's the healthiest thing in the world. So thank you, Tom Belt, for sharing that with us. Um, you know, I've, I've learned so much from these conversations with Tom and um, I think that was just a really nice way to describe that decolonization and, and what we know as health and well being. You know, the health disparities can't really be addressed within each tribe without thinking about language. And it was a really beautiful way to describe it. Um, Tom also shared with me, and he was referring to it here, that the Cherokee word for depression, I'll do my best because I'm a learner, is um, esca ou d'antan. And in that word and what he shared with me, I learned how important, you know, why language was so important because the philosophy of seeing the world as he says through a Cherokee prism is much different. You know, a Scott Udant Tom means um, uh, thinking back towards yourself. And well, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just, I'll try to, um, not go into it too much, but as he was referring to, you know, a Scott Udon taught the description of depression is looking towards yourself. So in, in that word, there's also a solution, which is you need to be reconnected with the world. If you're looking inwards, you're not looking at the world. You're not connected to the plants, animals, the peoples, your relationships aren't, aren't happening because you're looking back towards yourself. So, um, I just really appreciate that as an example of how important uh, language is for health and well being. So, you know, if someone were to ask me, you know, what is the key to health and well being? To me, I see it as connections and connectivity. And I think that is an indigenous principle. And I think also that um, Western science is catching up to that. So um, for example, positive family relationships put children on positive physical and mental health trajectories. So we know that um, you know, research in, in child development has found that positive relationships um, of infants, toddlers and mothers relate to um, lower rates of obesity in toddlers and puts them on a trajectory to reduce their rates of depression, um, anxiety, diabetes, and heart disease. 
The next, the next sort of level out is tribal connection and identity. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, indigenous youth who are more connected, they feel more connected to their tribe and to their tribal identity are, more, uh, are less likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, and have suicidal thoughts. Going up to that next level. So people um, who participate um, in traditional uh, tribal activities and um, have increased cultural knowledge have a number of positive health outcomes, both in the mental health and the physical health realms. Um, and lastly, connection to ecology, place, land, waters, plants, animals is related, related to improved health. Um, again, this is another one where I, I don't know if you see those, um, what they call like clickbait science articles, but they come up all the time for me saying things like, um, you know, talking about forest baths, people having, you know, improved uh, mental health after just five minutes, they, you know, they hook them up and they monitor their physiology and find that just after five minutes, people's physiology improves when they're outdoors. There's another study that said for people up in, um, up in those high rises in New York City, just having a picture on their wall of the outdoors improves their mental health. So, um, you know, again, if we had to kind of sum up health and well being, to me, I see it as connections to these particular areas. So, as far as what to do to increase those connections, um, I did a little bit of a review of what people are doing to indigenize health interventions to reduce health disparities. And they can do, um, you know, these interventions sometimes just have a sprinkling of indigenizing to all the way complete societal revitalization. And I'd like to share some of those examples with you. And the data, the data shows that curriculum that is culture-based um, has quite a bit of positive outcomes. Many of the, these research articles are with indigenous youth. And these curriculums in, incorporate cultural knowledge, traditions, and language, for example. So these kind of curriculums increase motivation of indigenous students, increase the involvement of students' families in their learning. These studies particularly look at um, indigenizing curriculum in education. So these students have improved GPAs when their culture is involved, less days of missing school, improved mental health. Um, in regards to, to culture and spirituality, uh, these curriculums reduce indigenous youth suicidality, hopelessness, depression, and result in improved self-reported physical health. So at these kind of beginning levels of tailoring, um, you know, cultural tailoring, it's usually interventions that were created for non-native people, like maybe a heart disease intervention or for mental health, like cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. And then they're tailored at a later date and they could be tailored in a pan Indian way or sometimes they're even tailored, you know, for a particular region, uh, region or tribe. They do use Western theories and techniques um, but research has found that even a small amount of tailoring results in better outcomes for the learners or their participants than when they don't tailor at all. So some examples are, you know, motivational interviewing, and that was tailored by Dr. Venner, or a cognitive behavioral therapy, and that was tailored by um, uh, Dr. Dolores Bigfoot uh, over there just a couple hours west of us. I know she came to NSU and did a wonderful talk, just it feels like a few months ago. So then we kind of move up to culturally grounded. So this intervention was created for native people versus just the tailored one, but it might still use a combination of Western and indigenous theories and techniques to address what, what other, whatever health disparity is being targeted. And in this category, um, this also has seen improvements up and beyond um, non-tailored uh, and only tailored alternatives. So the next level is culture as treatment. So uh, you might Google this or, or, or look for um, you know, culture as treatment for additional journal articles to learn more. Some of my favorite articles I wanted to share with you, one of my favorite articles actually, 
um, they have an intervention group called Pima Pride. So this took place in Arizona quite a long time ago, 1998. And what uh, these researchers did is they put folks in two groups. One was a culture group. They only learned about their culture. They learned to make baskets and pottery, history, and even a little bit of uh, language. The other group, um, they had on quite a regimented schedule of exercise and diet. They had to attend um, certain days of the week exercise groups um, and they monitored their diet. Come to find out the group that only did uh, the cultural intervention had reduced blood glucose at a higher, uh, a, a higher amount than the exercise and diet group. Um, this, this particular study has been kind of um, uh, my interest and motivation. Um, and uh, there's another study that was out of um, Hawaii on the island of Oahu. And the project was called Hula. And it was very similar. They had a group, a wait list group, and then they had a group that was learning the hula. And it's a little, and from what I understand, this is a little bit more than just dance that was involved. People did learn um, native Hawaiian language. They had a traditional healer as the person who, uh, our traditional knowledge keeper was the person who taught the hula. So with it became, um, you know, also cultural lessons, cultural philosophy, a native Hawaiian language, as well as the hula. Um, and so the hula group had significantly reduced uh, systolic blood pressure compared to the control group who just got some information about how to reduce blood pressure. And finally, another example is the culture as the treatment. Um, in this Blackfeet culture camp, it was an alternative to residential treatment for substance use. And it included a seasonal cultural immersion camp designed to approximate the day-to-day -day experiences of pre-reservation ancestors. So they were hunting bison and they were also making baskets, um, making pottery. They were learning about the history of their community. And um, the authors said that they believe that this post-colonial return to indigenous cultural orientations and practices is sufficient for affecting abstinence and recovery for substance use disorders for American Indians. And in a very similar story that Tom Belt, um, I apologize, came to share with uh, came to share with me, and 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 said that he would welcome me sharing it here today. Um, an example of how an indigenous community, and particularly an indigenous healer, addressed substance abuse. Um, in this particular example that I'll I'll share with you now. And he met the old man. The old man said, uh, how long have you been drinking? And he said, just about all my life. And he said, uh, he said, you want to quit then? Is that what you're talking about? And he said, yeah. And he said, hey, he said, yeah, I can help you. And he said, I can help you with that. He said, he said, uh, and, and he said, so he asked him, he, he said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to go home and uh, not drink for a year. Yeah. And he said, "What?" <laughs> he said, "He said that's it. I mean, I mean, that's all you can tell me is. Just, I mean, you know." He, he he said, "Actually, he didn't say that to him, but then he, he he said that's what I thought inside was what? What the hell? You know? <laughs> that didn't even make it. You know? I mean, that's not helpful. You know?" And and he said, you want me to go, I mean, you, you want me to go home and not drink for a year? He said, yeah. He said, I can help you. But he said, I'll have to meet you here next year. And between now and then, between now and the next ceremony, he said, don't, don't drink at all. And he said, when you come back, then, I'll, then, then um, I can start doing something to help you. He said, and that's all. He said, he said, so he said, I didn't know what else to do. He said, it didn't make any sense to me. And he said, I got up and started to walk away. And he said, when I was walking away a little ways, he said, that old man said, hey. And he said, I turned around. 
and he said, during this next year when you're not drinking, he said, go around and talk to all of the old people on the part of the reservation that you live on in that section. Go and talk to them and get to know them and find out what they're going to need in order to get through this next year. Uh, if they need wood for their stoves, uh, if they need somebody to bring them groceries every now and then, uh, he said, do everything that you're supposed to do to help them out over this next year. And he said, and also see to, he, he said, do you have brothers and sisters? And he said, yeah. He said, and, you, and you're gonna have to see to their families too. He said, um, you're gonna have to help them with their, with their kids. Those will be your nieces and nephews. He said, you have to make sure that they're okay. And he said, you take care of everybody like that and just do that as much as and as best you can for the next year and not drink that means you're going to have to have a job so you got to do something but he said do that you know and then come back and talk to me and uh, and he said so i did that you know he, he said i've been through five treatment centers he said i got shipped off to colorado once you know because he was from montana and he said, uh, six month therapies, year therapies, didn't work. And uh, he said, uh, so I, start, I just went home. And he said, and I started doing that, you know. He said, I went to visit all, you know, everybody that lived there, the old people and stuff like that. And he said, I told him, if you need anything, let me know. He said, I went to my brothers and sisters, their kids and stuff, he said, I, I tried to help out, I mean, I told him I'd help him out as much as I could with whatever they needed for school or stuff like that. And he said, and I got a job in order to make sure I'd have money. And he said, and, and in order to do all that stuff, I couldn't be out drunk or anything like that. He said, so he just always made sure that everybody was doing every, 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 everything. And uh, he said, you know, I, I didn't drink that whole year. And he said, the the uh, following year I went to, to a ceremony, he said, and the old man was there and he said, I told him I did it, you know, and, uh, and he, and, and, and he said, good. He said, now, he said, you have your job. He said, you can leave everybody alone now because they're going to come bother you, you know, now. <laughs> so you're stuck now, you know. But he said, I'm not for sure you're gonna like that, but <laughs> you're gonna be surprised how many, you know, how many of those people are gonna say, hey, you need to come over here, I need stuff, you know. <laughs> he said, but now we can begin. And he said, and began by simply helping out um, during that ceremony. And he said, and being available for that. And he said, and and doing the stuff that we do, he said, and all of us know what that is, he said, is, living our lives like we're supposed to in prayer and uh and doing those things uh uh that that uh, that are prescribed by uh uh ceremony and stuff he said so i'll go to all the ceremonies that i can do what i can for everyone he said and uh and i haven't drank in 20 years you know wow and 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 he said, and that's, I guess, one of the reasons why I'm here is because, you know, I got this job and stuff now to try and help get back the stuff that we've lost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 20 years ago, I was thinking to myself, 20 years ago, he would have been the last person that they would have trusted with that responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he wasn't the kind of person to to look to to help out and stuff like that and now he was the main one you know? mm -hmm. uh, because of his connection because of his commitment uh, not to himself but to others mm -hmm. you know
Okay. So again, thank you, Tom, for sharing that story and allowing me to share it today. Um, to me, what stands out is that um, this is, there was a prescription of a revitalizing of societal roles and, and um, this led to reconnection, um, which is kind of the center, going back to what the center that I see as health and well-being for indigenous people is connection. So the next level, besides culture is treatment. So in that example, there was already um, an issue, an illness. If we go the next level up, it would be prevention. So one example I wanted to share with you all of culture as prevention as I see it is the Cherokee Nation Remember the Removal Program. And I've spent the last six years evaluating this program, both qualitatively through focus groups, um, bugging all those RTR alums, thank you. <laughs> and um, we also did a, a study looking at um, two years of Eastern Band and Cherokee Nation folks in this program. I imagine many of you are familiar, but if you're not, this particular program starts in um, January and around 12 uh, Cherokee Nation 16 to 24 year olds learn Cherokee history, language and culture for about four months. They also learn how to ride bicycles and then they go on a three week, 950 mile bicycle ride, retracing the northern route of their removal. So I looked at a number of, of health outcomes and um, in comparison from when bef before they started to when they were um, about to go on the ride is the T1 to T2. And then the next that's lit up all green is from the comparison from before they started to when they returned from the bicycle ride and the program ended at that point. And then the last, the last time is a six month follow up. What was really impressive is this program was never designed to improve mental health. Uh, there is no one, uh, there's no behavioral health staff. It was not designed uh, to um, improve physical health outcomes. There in the past hasn't been any trainers, any dietitians. There might be some folks that, that do that now. But again, um, it's just so impressive that a program that the what we call active ingredient is culture and connection to culture, connection to one another with the whole purpose um, from what I've been told is to create leaders, Cherokee leaders, knowledgeable Cherokee leaders, knowledgeable in their language, their history and culture to be leaders in our community has resulted in such impressive results. So if it's <clears throat> lit up green, that means it's statistically significant, which is pretty impressive with the participants um, of 30 people. So there was improved positive mental health, reduced stress, depression, anxiety, anxiety anger, and microaggressions. And this lasted almost, um, this lasted six months for almost all of these outcomes. So this is an example of culture as prevention. We're hoping it prevents mental health and physical health uh, disorders because it starts early in the life cycle. Um, and then finally, the last stage would be cultural and societal revitalization. So this would be the revitalization of social structures of governing. So changing to like, you know, changing back to the use of clan mothers, for example, decision making, food systems, land management, family, parenting, birthing, medicine, etc. And a key component in all of that would be language revitalization. Um, as well as reconnection to family, tribe, and land. So some examples of what indigenized care looks like or indigenizing um, and reduce, to reduce healthcare disparities includes traditional language. And um, Dr. Fallon and Brie Alexander uh, did an amazing presentation yesterday morning. If you haven't seen it, hopefully it's recorded and you can take a look. At that, um, I attempted to sum up an article in one slide, which doesn't do it justice, but it's just so impressive the work that they've put together demonstrating um, the effect that traditional indigenous languages have on health. Um, in mental health, suicide rate was reduced in more fluent communities. Um, in Australia, there was uh, reduced alcohol um, 
and illicit drug consumption. In Hawaii, the, there was higher graduation rates in the language immersion schools up to 100% um, graduation rates compared to the university, or excuse me, con compared to the high schools, for example, um, that don't use language immersion. And um, as far as physical health, communities that were more fluent had less smokers, were in more positive health wellness uh, categories and had lower rates of diabetes. And I'm really looking forward to the work they're continuing to do in this area. I think it's very exciting. Because of that, some community-based uh, projects uh, that we started to do are looking at um, language immersion for zero to three. Um, when I had my son three years ago, um, I really wanted him to learn Cherokee and I didn't, there wasn't a formal way to do it. So um, a group of speakers and mothers got together and we started putting together curriculum that uh, we did in libraries, um, we did it at daycares and we did it online and we're hoping to submit a grant in the future, really pairing and demonstrating that prenatal and infant indigenous language experience puts children on a trajectory of good health for the rest of their lives. So we're working on that. Um, also traditional cultural activities uh, people who, Native people who participate in traditional cultural activities, uh, research has found have better um, academic performance, better positive mental health, reduced substance use and improved physical health. So um, some other community projects we've been doing are um, teaching traditional food and medicine. We, we work with um, Cherokee speakers to do these programs all in the Cherokee language first and then English second. Research has also demonstrated that cultural connectedness is a critical important part of uh, native youth resiliency and is a vital protective factor. Youth who have a strong bond with family, community and elders um, have increased protective factors compared to youth with less cultural identity connectedness. And just like what Tom Belt was talking about, that traditional healer didn't focus. He kind of put the alcohol addiction on a shelf and he focused on connecting to community and research, Western research is, is um, catching up with that component as well. Um, programs are more effective when they focus on connecting to community than trying to decrease you know, American Indian suicidality or depression, et cetera. So lastly, we're working on a project about history, culture, and language. This is a grant funded project. It's very exciting because the, we're using culture as prevention to reduce heart disease risk in the future. We're engaging in community advisory board and we're hoping that the curriculum that will be really tailored to um, particular communities who are interested. So again, going back to the main points, um, indigenous health is holistic colonization has degraded the health status of indigenous people, but culture and the act of cultural revitalization and a connection and teaching and using traditional cultural practices are preventive measures for physical and mental health risks. So um, with that, thank you all. Wado, Nagad, Galiele Ga, thank you for being here today. Um, thank you to our grant funders. I do have a list of some of our publications and I'm, I'm happy to share um, these slides if, it, if anyone is interested. Um, I know we're at our time. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, I see some questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I think we had one question in the chat um, from David Nagel. It says, Daryl Kipp and Dorothy Still Smoking found that their immersion school students did not exhibit the same difficulties endemic to the well-resourced preservation school. They cited mostly behavior issues, uh, but I would expect physical health improvements in addition to mental health improvement. Um, has this actually been studied? I guess like um, if there was um, physical as well as mental health improvement along with the behavioral issues improvement in that um, area of emergent schools. 
Um, thank you for asking this question. Um, this is a really important question. Good to see you. Um, I'm actually not even familiar with this study and I probably would rather direct this to, um, I, I saw Dr. Fallon here before, but this might be um, a better, a, he might be able to respond to this better. Um, there are some discrepancies, you know, some of the research that I have done has demonstrated, um, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of relationship between traditional cultural activities and and positive and negative health status. And I didn't, I didn't actually kind of share all of that today because I think it's all being worked out. I can't, I don't think I'm really qualified to answer this question, but I can tell you similarly, what we know about um, the data with, with um, people who participate in traditional cultural activities or you know, people who are speakers are fluent, they also experience things like racism and historical trauma at higher rates than people who don't. So there's, there's so many things happening at the same time. So the effects of racism are happening while the effects of the connectivity to the traditional, traditional values and philosophy. So this is very difficult to piece out like statistically. Um, and I guess that's, that's, that's the, the, the only thing I think is value added <laughs> that I can share with you right now, but I'm really interested in this question. Um, and I, I'm going to continue to work on it. And if you have any thoughts, please share them or now, later, another time. I, this is a really important area of investigation. And um, Dr. Fallon also might be a really good resource to answer this. And if you take a look at their presentation, they talked a little bit about this yesterday. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, the sessions are being recorded and we will make those available. So if you did want to go ahead and go back and look at the section, the session that Dr. Lewis mentioned, um, that will be uh, something you're able to do. Um, so I would just like to thank Dr. Lewis for coming today. Um, I really enjoyed the session. Um, I think it's really important that we start looking at how healthcare and culture um, combined because you can't treat just one part of a person. You've got to treat the whole person. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us. Um, I do believe we have posted a survey in the chat. Um, so everyone attending, if you could please take a moment to fill that out. Uh, it allows us to gain feedback and um, better improve programming um, going into the future as well. Um, Dr. Lewis, Wado for being here. Um, we appreciate it and um, thank you everyone for attending as well and have a nice day. Oh no, Jackie, y'all take care. <laughs>